people who have the raw material of greatness in them, the progress of the sun has always been a spur. A reminder that if man stands still while time moves forward, he's really going backwards. And as with a man, a business or a nation must also move with time or the world leaves it behind. We've not been left behind because freedom has assured our progress. The pioneers who spread across our continent tamed the land for living, and we've been improving that living ever since. We've never stopped and said, this is the best we can do. As soon as we create a thing, we make it obsolete with something better. This has been the pattern of our progress in the past, and we can see it now by watching what's happening hour by hour throughout a great American industry on any single day. Start at the beginning, at midnight. Let's say it's Tuesday. For more than half this country's life, the production of petroleum has been a measure of our progress. This Tuesday, America's thousands of producing oil companies will draw more than five million barrels of crude oil from the earth. How does this oil serve the nation? Here's one way, through the power of gasoline. Thanks to this power, only 19 minutes have elapsed between the hurried call to the doctor and this moment. It's now 1.27. And at the same moment, at 1.27, down in the Gulf of Mexico, there are others who are taking part in that patient's case. Doctors, nurses, and ambulance drivers are not alone in working around the clock. An oil man working on a drilling rig in the bayou can tell you that. This number 31 well's been a real headache ever since we started. Last week, we wore out 12 drilling bits. Then today, the pressure in the hole built up fast, and we had to shut down and go to 18-pound mud to keep the well from blowing out. Mud in the oil business is something real special. It's got to be mixed and weighed, just like a doctor's prescription. Well, I guess everything's OK now. Things seem to have quieted down. These hardworking men don't pretend to be angels of mercy, but the oil from wells they and men like them drill helps to speed our ambulances through city streets. In the operating room, the byproducts of petroleum play a big part too. They appear as rubber gloves and anesthetics, as drugs and alcohol, and they may help to save a life or start one. Seven thirty-one. The early morning sun is shining now outside the hospital. In another time zone, several states to the north, it also looks down on a site where in a few months there'll be an eight-lane superhighway. days, roads followed trails, which followed animal paths, not always the shortest distance between two points. Today, we push our roads just where we want them to go.
ancient Romans were road builders too, but they had slaves to do the work. In America, we don't think so much in terms of plain manpower as in terms of man-using power. In the few decades since petroleum, no job has been so big that we could not design the power tools to handle it. Today, the strength in a man's back or in his arms isn't important. It's the strength he controls beyond his fingertips that counts. To meet our nation's needs, whatever they may be, this strength can be delivered anywhere at any time from over 400,000 oil wells. Twenty-four hours a day, deliveries of oil go on, starting at the pipeline companies with the chief dispatcher's pumping orders. Our problem here is mainly one of traffic. Almost every foot of this company's 7,000 miles of pipe is full of some sort of petroleum. We have to keep it moving and get it where it's going, on time. At the Indian River pumping station, the order tells them to sidetrack one kind of crude oil temporarily and to send the type the refinery needs right now through in its place. We've scheduled it to end up at the refinery just when they're ready to handle it. Now we've crossed a dozen states to a west coast airport. Attention, flight 34 to Chicago and New York, now loading at gate number one and ready for departure at 8.50. Today, a man going east on business need count only one day lost to travel. His great-grandfather may have taken two years, or three, or his life to cover the same distance. From the Conestoga wagon to the Constellation is just one example of our progress in three generations. Why should Americans seem to have a secret formula for progress? Part of the answer is their freedom. Freedom to fly 3,000 miles across one united land. And the only passport we need is a ticket and the baggage check. Even more important, we're free to compete, to try to outdo the other fellow, to design a better airplane and refine a better gasoline to power it. This freedom to compete not only assures American progress, it assures our security as a nation. States, nine o'clock in the morning means time for school. Mrs. George W. Martin, driving one of America's more than 36 million cars, starts on her first errand of an average day to get some gasoline for the car. Mrs. Martin doesn't spend much time thinking about petroleum. She probably doesn't know that petroleum helps make the synthetic rubber for her tires and asphalt for the roads they roll on. All she knows is that her car needs gasoline and oil and something her husband calls a grease job when the speedometer says it's time. Yes, to Mrs. Martin, as to most of us, her service station is the oil industry. The station's operator, Ed Felix, is an oil man. Like the industry he represents, his best product is something no refinery can distill. Service. Service is more than free air and water, maps and travel information. It's also friendliness, help and cooperation when they're needed. The gallon of gasoline that Mrs. Martin buys is a bargain in power because through research, Oil men have learned a lot about making motor fuel since the first horseless carriage. Behind the constant progress in quality lies competition. Competition is the mainspring of American business. For example, there are a quarter of a million places in America where one can buy gasoline and oil. 
and 95% of them are run by independent businessmen like Ed Felix. Owner, that's me. This town's grown a lot since I was a boy here. The automobile did that. If it hadn't been for highways and trucking, the chances are this would be a ghost town. But you can see it's not. There are eight service stations here. That means seven other places folks like the Martins can take their business. So I know all about competition. Been in it up to my neck ever since I started out with just one pump. Got a pretty nice place now. As the day moves on, and as the Ed Felixes all over the country serve their public, it's easy to understand why new oil must constantly be found. Beneath our airplane now is an isolated California ranch house. Temporary headquarters for a man known as a wildcatter. A man who is in the business of finding new oil. Nobody tells him where to find it, that's up to him. By nature, the wildcatter must be a player of long shots. He knows that in drilling what they call exploratory oil wells, four out of every five will turn out to be dry holes. Well, we're a little more scientific than we used to be. The old boys said they could find oil by smelling it out. I start with a map of what the earth looks like underground. My geophysical crew makes the map for me so I can tell if the piece of land is worth putting any more money into. It's about all we can do to take some of the guesswork out of what's still a big gamble. The mapping starts when we drill shallow holes every few hundred yards. These aren't oil wells, just holes that go down about 75 or 100 feet. In them, we put some dynamite, and then we fill them up with water. You see, we map with a seismograph, the same gadget they use to measure earthquakes with. The dynamite makes our earthquake. The sound waves that echo off the underground rock give us a picture of what it's like down there. But that's only the beginning. The seismographic record just tells where oil might be. The only way I know of finding it is to drill. Right now, in Scurry County, Texas, a producing company is getting ready to do just that, drill a well. They're moving their rig into a territory where they know oil has already been found. But that's no guarantee that this particular well will come in. They still have to gamble equipment, supplies, men, and time, just on the chance of striking oil. Today, as men drill deeper and deeper to find the porous, oil-filled rock, a single well can cost up to a million dollars. some wells flow by themselves. Others have to be pumped. In many oil producing states, each well produces under a field quota called an allowable, which is set by state authorities. Such scientific conservation methods mean progress, and nobody knows it better than the state conservation man who works with the oil companies. That's right. You know, in the old days, sometimes as much as two-thirds of the crew they might have gotten was left underground. Taking out oil as fast as possible is inefficient and wasteful. Around here, you'll find wells 20 and 30 years old being reworked and oil being recovered. 
but in some places the stuff's lost forever. Measuring and checking as I do every day, you don't find such waste going on now. In many modern fields, recycling plants process a lot of the natural gas that used to be wasted. These days the gas goes through all this fancy equipment and out of it comes chemicals which are used in making cloth and paint and plastics and I don't know what all. If that's not progress, what is? Well, time to eat. It's mealtime in the air, too. The airline passengers settling lunch trays in their laps can look down on the very farms that feed them. Farming has changed more in the last 50 years than it did in the previous thousand. A farmer today can work five times the land his father worked and still have time for leisure that his father never knew. The petroleum that runs these modern hired hands has not confined progress in farming to the fields. Life is easier for the farm wife, too. For one thing, her wood pile is a thing of the past. To do her cooking and heating today, she can have liquefied petroleum gas delivered to the house by a local dealer. Petroleum does still other jobs that farmers would once have thought were miracles. Petroleum derivatives kill insects and plant diseases, speed the ripening of fruit, and preserve it on the way to market. Today, a farmer can fight the odds of nature instead of giving in to them. Each hour of the day, our oil-thirsty nation demands over 10 million gallons of petroleum products. Between these and the raw material from which they come, there has to be a factory. The refinery is that factory. Just a few decades ago, a refinery was a primitive still, making only kerosene. Today, some of these great plants employ thousands of people. To many in American community, their establishment and growth has meant new economic life. Listen. My job is painting, keeping the outside of all these pipes and columns in good shape. I used to live here before the refinery was built. Hundred rabbits in the brush where those alkylation units are now. There wasn't much doing over in town then. A lot of folks were even fixing to move out. But then the company moved in and set up this refinery. That gave new life to the town, new jobs. It meant a lot. Now almost every family has someone in the oil business. You know, every day, a lot of oil products move out of here. All the time I'm at work, there's one jobber's truck after another coming in to get filled up. One of the biggest carriers of both crude oil and refined products is the modern tanker, which with speed and economy can deliver its cargo to any port in the seven seas where it may be needed. The oil industry's own navy is a vital factor in the security of our nation. This tanker sailing westward tonight from San Pedro, California, is carrying in her side and center tanks aviation gasoline, jet fuel, and diesel fuel. Some five million gallons in all. While the tanker is loading in California, a barge filled with home fuel oil has just left a refinery in Louisiana and is heading slowly upriver for the docks of an independent distributor. And at the same time, in the port of New York, the SS America is taking on over 800,000 gallons of bunker fuel. 
since petroleum provides the power for both our ships of peace and for our ships of war, oil power means sea power for our nation. Power for the sea is also power for the land. More than any other country in the world, America is a nation on wheels. The automobile and the power behind it have been major factors in the growth of our country. We can drive anywhere we want to, at any time, for any reason, including fun. Out of the city into the country, down to the sea if we're inland, to the mountains if we live on the coast. To meet the demands of our over 36 million cars, oil canning plants also work around the clock. Together, we drive our cars a billion miles a day. It seems no other people in the world want so much just to get going when they have a little time. Maybe it's just that no other people can get going so easily. Every hour of the day finds oil men trying to make petroleum do more for us. The oil scientists and research laboratories are pace setters in the race of progress, working with products still unnamed and some that are still unthought of. With each new development of our inventive age, be it peaceful or otherwise, the petroleum industry is faced with a host of new problems. Our thousands of competing oil companies invest over a hundred million dollars every year in research. Each company's objective is the same discover a new product, perfect it, and put it in production before the others do. They start with competition. What they create is progress. With the switch to another brand of gasoline, or with the purchase of a new detergent made from an oil byproduct, a company has lost a customer. Another company has gained a customer. It's as simple as that. What it comes down to is that the oil industry has to please Mrs. Martin and millions just like her. Already today, she's used some 87 petroleum products, including the plastic bacon wrapper and the wax of the milk carton. She'll top 100 before the day is over. Mrs. Martin is the customer, and the customer is the boss of the oil industry. This Tuesday's daylight has almost gone. Electric power stations are getting ready for the hour of peak load, that sudden increase in the demand for service which comes with the dark. Even though the old oil lamp is a thing of the past, oil still helps light up America. travelers from the west have crossed a whole continent since morning.
Not for one mile or hour were they out of hearing of the men and women in the petroleum industry. Oil and the people who bring it to us are so much a part of our lives that they are everywhere. Our Tuesday is ending and the country goes to bed. But everyone is not asleep. The traffic in front of Ed Felix's isn't very heavy now, but there's still someone on duty to give you service. At the refinery, the night shift has taken over on the stills and fractionating columns. The tanker is plowing on at 16 knots. On the bridge, the mate is checking the course to a port 7,000 miles away. At the well on the Gulf of Mexico, the drilling bit chewing at the rock beneath the bayou is a hundred feet closer to oil than it was last night. At the Indian River pumping station, other grades of crude are in the line now, pushing ahead of them the shipment the refinery needs tomorrow morning. It's midnight again. Tuesday has waned and is gone. The pump does not know when midnight comes. Days are the same to it. It pumps from Tuesday into Wednesday without a halt. Each day, every day, it brings us another 24 hours of progress. Building our nation, guarding its security, assuring the future of America.